Elihu was a friend of Job, not one of the three who came to comfort Job at the start, but one who comes afterward and gives Job the final and longest single speech in the book of Job. Elihu is only identified as the son of Barakel, the Buzite, of the Ram family. Job 32 2. But Elihu, son of Barakel, the Buzite, of the family of Ram, became very angry with Job for justifying himself rather than God. In Job 32 through 37, Elihu responds to Job by extolling the Lord, condemning Job's three other friends, and justifiably confronts Job. Elihu concentrates his response in Job 32 on condemning Job's three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. I give you my full attention, he says in verse 12, but not one of you has proven Job wrong. None of you has answered his arguments. And since Elihu was younger than Job's other friends, he had remained silent during their discussion. Job 32, 4-7 through now Elihu had waited before speaking to Job, because they were older than he. But when he saw that the three men had nothing more to say, his anger was aroused. So Elihu, son of Barakel the Buzite, said, I am young in years, and you are old. That is why I was fearful, not daring to tell you what I know. I thought age should speak, advanced years should teach wisdom. Elihu spoke up because he was very angry with Job for justifying himself rather than God, as well as with Job's three friends because they had found no argument to refute Job, and yet they had criticized him. Job 32, 2-3 But Elihu, son of Barakel the Buzite of the family of Ram, became very angry with Job for justifying himself rather than God. He was also angry with the three friends because they had found no way to refute Job, and yet had condemned him. Elihu turned his attention to Job in Job 33. He states that Job was incorrect in his assertion that he was sinless and that God would not respond. But I tell you, in this you are not correct, for God is greater than any mortal, says Elihu. Elihu says, in Job 34, Elihu changes his focus to proclaiming God's justice. It is unthinkable that God would do wrong, that the Almighty would pervert justice. Job 34, 12. In Job 35, Elihu returns to Job to criticize him. Job 35, 13 through 14. Indeed, God does not listen to their empty plea. The Almighty pays no attention to it. How much less, then, will he listen when you say that you do not see him, that your case is before him and you must wait for him? Elihu emphasizes God's majesty. Many of God's attributes are declared in this chapter. Job 36, 26 How great is God beyond our understanding! The number of his years is past finding out. Job 37, 14. Listen to this, Job. Stop and consider God's wonders. In summary, Elihu condemns Job's friends in Job's claim of sinlessness, proclaims God's justice, decries Job's attitude toward God, and extols God's greatness. Following Elihu's four-part speech, God breaks his silence to directly respond to Job. The Lord condemns Eliphaz, Bilidad, and Zophar in Job 42. After completing his speech, Elihu is not referenced again, but, more importantly, he is not rebuked by God. Job 42, 7 After the Lord has said these things to Job, he said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, I am angry with you and your two friends, because you have not spoken the truth about me, as my servant Job has. But now, Job, listen to my words. Pay attention to everything I say. I am about to open my mouth. My words are on the tip of my tongue. My words come from an upright heart, 
My lips sincerely speak what I know. The Spirit of God has made me. The breath of the Almighty gives me life. Answer me then, if you can. Stand up and argue your case before me. I am the same as you in God's sight. I too am a piece of clay. No fear of me should alarm you, nor should my hand be heavy on you. But you have said in my hearing, I hear the very words, I am pure, I have done no wrong. I am clean and free from sin. Yet God has found fault with me. He considers me his enemy. He fastens my feet in shackles. He keeps close watch on all my paths. But I tell you, in this you are not right. For God is greater than any mortal. Why do you complain to him when he responds to no one's words? For God does speak, now one way, now another, though no one perceives it. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls on people as they slumber in their beds, he may speak in their ears and terrify them with warnings, to turn them from wrongdoing and keep them from pride to preserve them from the pit, their lives from perishing by the sword. Or someone may be chastened on a bed of pain with constant distress in their bones so that their body finds food repulsive and their soul loathes the choicest meal. Their flesh wastes away to nothing and their bones, once hidden, now stick out. They draw near to the pit and their life to the messengers of death. Yet if there is an angel at their side, a messenger, one out of a thousand, sent to tell them how to be upright, and he is gracious to that person and says to God, Spare them from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom for them. Let their flesh be renewed like a child's. Let them be restored as in the days of their youth. Then that person can pray to God and find favor with him. They will see God's face and shout for joy. He will restore them to full well-being, and they will go to others and say, I have sinned, I have perverted what is right, but I did not get what I deserved. God has delivered me from going down to the pit, and I shall live to enjoy the light of life. God does all these things to a person, twice, even three times, to turn them back from the pit that the light of life may shine on them. Pay attention, Job, and listen to me. Be silent, and I will speak. If you have anything to say, answer me. Speak up, for I want to vindicate you. But if not, then listen to me. Be silent, and I will teach you wisdom. Then Elihu said, Hear my words. You wise men, listen to me, you men of learning, for the ear tests words as the tongue tastes food. Let us discern for ourselves what is right. Let us learn together what is good. Job says, I am innocent, but God denies me justice. Although I am right, I am considered a liar. Although I am guiltless, his arrow inflicts an incurable wound. Is there anyone like Job? who drinks scorn like water. He keeps company with evildoers. He associates with the wicked. For he says, There is no profit in trying to please God. So listen to me, you men of understanding. Far be it from God to do evil, from the Almighty to do wrong. He repays everyone for what they have done. He brings on them what their conduct deserves. It is unthinkable that God would do wrong that the Almighty would pervert justice. Who appointed him over the earth? Who put him in charge of the whole world? If it were his intention and he withdrew his spirit and breath, all humanity would perish together and mankind would return to the dust. If you have understanding, hear this. Listen to what I say. Can someone who hates justice govern? Will you condemn the just and mighty one? Is he not the one who says to kings, You are worthless, and to nobles, You are wicked, who shows no partiality to princes and does not favor the rich over the poor, for they are all the work of his hands? 
They die in an instant, in the middle of the night. The people are shaken and they pass away. The mighty are removed without human hand. His eyes are on the ways of mortals. He sees their every step. There is no deep shadow, no utter darkness where evildoers can hide. God has no need to examine people further. That they should come before him for judgment. Without inquiry, he shatters the mighty and sets up others in their place. Because he takes note of their deeds. He overthrows them in the night and they are crushed. He punishes them for their wickedness where everyone can see them because they turned from following him and had no regard for any of his ways. They caused the cry of the poor to come before him, so that he heard the cry of the needy. But if he remains silent, who can condemn him? If he hides his face, who can see him? Yet he is over individual and nation alike, to keep the godless from ruling, from laying snares for the people. Suppose someone says to God, I am guilty, but will offend no more. Teach me what I cannot see. If I have done wrong, I will not do so again. Should God then reward you on your terms when you refuse to repent? You must decide, not I. So tell me what you know. Men of understanding declare, wise men who hear me say to me. Job speaks without knowledge. His words lack insight. Oh, that Job might be tested to the utmost for answering like a wicked man. To his sin he adds rebellion. Scornfully he claps his hands among us and multiplies his words against God. Then Elihu said, Do you think this is just? You say I am in the right, not God. Yet you ask him, What profit is it to me? And what do I gain by not sinning? I would like to reply to you and to your friends with you. Look up at the heavens and see. Gaze at the clouds so high above you. If you sin, how does that affect him? If your sins are many, what does that do to him? If you are righteous, what do you give to him? Or what does he receive from your hand? Your wickedness only affects humans like yourself, and your righteousness only other people. People cry out under a load of oppression. They plead for relief from the arm of the powerful. But no one says, Where is God, my Maker, who gives songs in the night, who teaches us more than he teaches the beasts of the earth and makes us wiser than the birds in the sky? He does not answer when people cry out because of the arrogance of the wicked. Indeed, God does not listen to their empty plea. The Almighty pays no attention to it. How much less then will he listen when you say that you do not see him, that your case is before him and you must wait for him, and further, that his anger never punishes and he does not take the least notice of wickedness. So Job opens his mouth with empty talk. Without knowledge, he multiplies words. Elihu continued, Bear with me a little longer and I will show you that there is more to be said on God's behalf. I get my knowledge from afar. I will ascribe justice to my Maker. Be assured that my words are not false. One who has perfect knowledge is with you. God is mighty, but despises no one. He is mighty and firm in his purpose. He does not keep the wicked alive, but gives the afflicted their rights. He does not take his eyes off the righteous. He enthrones them with kings and exalts them forever. But if people are bound in chains, held fast by cords of affliction, he tells them what they have done, that they have sinned arrogantly. He makes them listen to correction and commands them to repent of their evil. If they obey and serve him, they will spend the rest of their days in prosperity and their years in contentment. But if they do not listen, they will perish by the sword and die without knowledge. The godless in heart harbor resentment, even when he fetters them. They do not cry for help. They die in their youth among male prostitutes of the shrines. But those who suffer he delivers in their suffering. He speaks to them in their affliction. He is wooing you from the jaws of distress to a spacious place free from restriction, to the comfort of your table laden with choice food. But now you are laden with the judgment due the wicked. 
judgment and justice have taken hold of you. Be careful that no one entices you by riches. Do not let a large bribe turn you aside. Would your wealth or even all your mighty efforts sustain you so you would not be in distress? Do not long for the night to drag people away from their homes. Beware of turning to evil, which you seem to prefer to affliction. God is exalted in his power. Who is a teacher like him? Who has prescribed his ways for him or said to him, you have done wrong? Remember to extol his work, which people have praised in song. All humanity has seen it. Mortals gaze on it from afar. How great is God beyond our understanding. The number of his years is past finding out. He draws up the drops of water, which distill as rain to the streams. The clouds pour down their moisture and abundant showers fall on mankind. Who can understand how he spreads out the clouds, how he thunders from his pavilion? See how he scatters his lightning about him, bathing the depths of the sea. This is the way he governs the nations. It provides food in abundance. He fills his hands with lightning and commands it to strike its mark. His thunder announces the coming storm. Even the cattle make known its approach. At this my heart pounds and leaps from its place. Listen. Listen to the roar of his voice, to the rumbling that comes from his mouth. He unleashes his lightning beneath the whole heaven and sends it to the ends of the earth. After that comes the sound of his roar, he thunders with his majestic voice. When his voice resounds, he holds nothing back. God's voice thunders in marvelous ways. He does great things beyond our understanding. He says to the snow, fall on the earth, and to the rain shower, be a mighty downpour, so that everyone he has made may know his work. He stops all people from their labor. The animals take cover, they remain in their dens. The tempest comes out from its chamber, the cold from the driving winds. The breath of God produces ice, and the broad waters become frozen. He loads the clouds with moisture, he scatters his lightning through them. At his direction they swirl around over the face of the whole earth to do whatever he commands them. He brings the clouds to punish people, or to water his earth and show his love. Listen to this, Job. Stop and consider God's wonders. Do you know how God controls the clouds and makes his lightning flash? Do you know how the clouds hang poised, those wonders of him who has perfect knowledge? You who swelter in your clothes when the land lies hushed under the south wind, can you join him in spreading out the skies hard as a mirror of cast bronze? Tell us what we should say to him. We cannot draw up our case because of our darkness. Should he be told that I want to speak? Would anyone ask to be swallowed up? Now no one can look at the sun, bright as it is in the skies, after the wind has swept them clean. Out of the north he comes in golden splendor. God comes in awesome majesty. The Almighty is beyond our reach and exalted in power. In his justice and great righteousness, he does not oppress. Therefore, people revere him, for does he not have regard for all the wise in heart? Elihu's life and speech provide many lessons. First, instead of approaching the situation from a human standpoint, he dealt with the real issues. Furthermore, rather than focusing on a human response to problems, he emphasized God and his greatness. Finally, he responded with dignity, allowing others to speak first before responding. These characteristics can help us understand why God allows suffering and how we can help others who are suffering today.